Good Easter morning to you. It's a pleasure to be able to gather together in a virtual sense anyway. Just a couple of announcements this morning, very briefly. On the YouTube video, if you scroll down there in the description, there's a link to the worship guide and there's a link to the sermon handout. You can download those, you can access those. They're hyperlinked there and you may use those to uh, to bless your worship experience, to uh, use uh, as you review the service and as you uh, think through the ramifications of what we're talking about this morning. So please download those. You're welcome to them. And we're thankful for this opportunity to share those with you. As we gather our hearts together to worship this morning, please respond as we exchange the Paschal greeting on this Easter morning. Good morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Our call to worship this morning celebrates this very truth that we worship Christ the Lord today. We worship him in spirit and in truth. He is the lamb who was slain as John the Baptist proclaimed, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but he's also the lion, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. And it is this lion who is the lamb that we come to celebrate this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate him and we hear the Lord's call to worship from Revelation chapter 5. We'll begin reading in the middle of the chapter. The Apostle John writes as follows, Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Dear brothers and sisters, you and I have the opportunity to join them in that worship this morning as we worship the lion who is the lamb. Indeed, he is worthy. He is worthy to receive blessing and glory and honor and might and wisdom and wealth and power today and always. So let us stand and sing his praises for Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand as we sing. saints to reign 
He arose, He arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch His bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning for you. Yes, you suffered. Yes, you died. But yes, you have also risen. Indeed, we celebrate your rising again from the dead on the third day. On this day, uh, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this Easter Sunday. And we thank you, Lord, that no matter how much distance and time may separate us from one another, yet we can gather together around your throne today. We can gather together to sing the praises of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, our risen Savior, the one who has completed his work, the one who has completely satisfied our debt of sin. And Lord, we are blessed in this and we are welcomed into the Father's presence. Indeed, you came to show us the Father's love. It was because of the Father's love that you came and you have finished your work and now you apply it by your Holy Spirit. And we praise you and we thank you for this joyful day, this joyful day, this joyful spring day in which we see the earth erupting with flowers and leaves and plants and uh, animals and livestock giving birth and all these wonderful events that are happening even now. Lord, all these rejoice in new life and we rejoice in the new life that we have in Christ today. And so we thank you, we praise you, we love you, and we would honor you today Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for this mighty work of redemption and for applying it now to our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather our hearts together around your throne. And we thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your kingdom. It is a great joy to be a part of this kingdom of light, this kingdom of life, this kingdom of love and joy and peace and righteousness. Lord, we rejoice in this kingdom and we want to see this kingdom spread from sea to sea and from one end of the earth to the other. And we rejoice in this kingdom because we have been made glad by the king. And so it is to our king and for his kingdom that we now pray. As our Lord Jesus himself taught us to pray, we now lift our voices in prayer together saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen and amen. What a great joy it is to be a part of this kingdom. We rejoice in the truth of the gospel. We rejoice in the truth of this triune God. It is this faith in the triune God that we confess with the Apostles' Creed this morning. If this is your confession of faith, would you now please confess it with me? Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. What a great joy it is to be comforted by these truths which are passed down from age to age, from generation to generation, as we confess the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It is because of this faith that we have been given that we have such comfort as we, in that Apostles' Creed, we believe in the resurrection of the dead and we believe in the life everlasting. And so as we come to uh, confess our sin this morning, I thought it appropriate for us to look at the Heidelberg Catechism, question one from the first Lord's Day. Uh, such a wonderful comfort to us, no matter what time in which we live, but perhaps especially in these times. The first question asks us, what is your only comfort in life and in death? It answers as follows, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. What wonderful words these are. What a blessed comfort they are in this particular time that we belong to our God. We belong to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We belong to him. And because of that, we know that he has us in the palm of his hand. He knows us. He knows our name. Our name has been written on his heart, engraven on his hands. And so we are so grateful to belong to him. And in that belonging, we find such peace and such comfort. Even while we know that we're sinners, even while we know that we fall short of God's glory every day, every hour of the day, we know that we're loved. And because we know we're loved, we can go to God and confess our sin to him and trust him to forgive us and to cleanse us. And so let's take a brief moment now to confess our sin to him and ask him for his pardon once again, knowing that he delights to give it to us through Christ. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for the redemption that we have in you, the redemption that we have through your shed blood, Indeed, the blood of Christ is not yet dry, but still is effective to wash sinners like us, to wash us clean. As we'll sing in just a moment in the hymn, Rock of Ages, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me Savior or I die. Lord, we realize that our sins are foul. They are a stench in your nostrils. They are offensive. 
and they are a grief to your heart. And while we acknowledge the breadth of our sin, how many we've committed of so many different types, and we acknowledge the depth of our sin, a depth which we don't know this side of eternity. But as we acknowledge the breadth and the depth of our sin, we thank you, Lord, that your love goes deeper and that your blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness of every type and every depth, even down to the deepest parts of who we are, parts where, truth be told, maybe we dare not go. But we thank you, Lord, that you did go there, that you cleanse us of all of our sin. We bless you and we thank you. So thank you, Lord Jesus, the rock of ages, who has cleft for us. We hide ourselves in you today. So bless us with a certain knowledge that our sins are forgiven because of you and help us to walk in that righteousness, to be wholeheartedly willing and ready to live for Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your grace to us, for your power to help us today and always as we lift this prayer through Christ, by the Spirit, to the Father. Amen and amen. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin a double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Thou I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. There's a line in one of Wendell Berry's Sabbath poems. He says, we live by mercy if we live. And this is true. So let's go to the God who is indeed merciful and let us ask his mercy upon us today. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come to you today recognizing that it is indeed a, a joyful day for it is Easter Sunday. It's a day to rejoice in our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who broke down death's bars from the inside. We thank you, Lord, that you have torn the bars away and you have given us mercy far beyond what we could ever deserve already. 
And yet, even in the midst of that, we recognize that you delight to give mercy to all kinds of people, but especially to your people. And so we are gathering our hearts now around your throne to plead for your mercy upon us, but also upon the rest of the world right now. We pray, Lord, that you would have mercy upon the human race as the vast majority of countries in the world are experiencing some degree of this COVID-19 pandemic. There are few, if any, countries left unaffected and it has brought sadness and grief and death to the whole world. And so we recognize our common humanity in this, but we as your people recognize our need for your mercy. We need your mercy upon the human race to deliver us from this pandemic, that you would do so in the proper timing and in the proper way. We want your purposes to be fulfilled above all else, and we trust you to do that. We pray for your mercy on those who are grieving losses right now, those who are grieving but they cannot be with their families, their loved ones. Have mercy, O Lord. We pray for those who are on the front lines in many different ways, doctors and nurses, hospital staff, first responders, We lift them up to you, Lord, and we pray that you would have mercy upon them, grant them strength and wisdom and courage. We also lift up those who are struggling under these stay-at-home orders. We pray for families. We pray for those whose families are no happy place but a place of challenge, a place of uh, grief, a place of violence. We pray, Lord, that you'd have mercy on those who are in need of your protection, especially for widows, especially for orphans, especially for the fatherless, especially those who are in need of a protector. We thank you, O Lord, that in your word you tell us that a protector of widows and orphans is God in his holy habitation. And so, Lord, would you protect them even now. We pray for those who are exercising various ministries of mercy for food banks and for distribution centers. We ask, Lord, that you would help them and Keep them strong and keep them healthy. We pray for those who are working in supermarkets and grocery stores. Those who are delivering those supplies, the truckers and for the engineers, uh, for uh, flights and for various means and modes of distribution around the world. Lord, we pray that you would Uh, keep these supply chains flowing so that people would have what they need. We also want to pray for the governments of the world, especially for our own government here in the United States, for our president, for Congress, for the Supreme Court, for state and local governments as well. Have mercy upon them, O Lord and grant them great wisdom to do what needs to be done, courage to do what needs to be done. Grant them what they need to do what needs to be done. And finally, for ourselves, Lord, we would pray that you would help us to love our neighbors well in this particular time. Neighbor love is always the demand of the day. And it's the order of today. And so help us, O Lord, we pray, 
to love our neighbors well, to check in on folks that you had put them on our minds, the people maybe whom we've forgotten for a little while and we need to reconnect with them. We need to ask them how they're doing. We need to supply as we're able. And we pray for your church to shine as lights in a dark world, that you would help us to shine with the light and the love of Christ, even now. Thank you, O Lord, for having mercy upon us. So grant us what we need to do what you've asked. We ask all these prayers in the name and by the authority of Christ. Amen. Well, here on this Easter Sunday, we're going to take just a little break from the Gospel of Mark. So we'll get back to that, Lord willing, next week, and then we'll be able to celebrate Jesus' resurrection when we get to that passage in Mark's Gospel. Today, we're going to take a break, and we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 2, which I admit is a, an uncustomary text for Easter Sunday. I think it's okay because this is certainly an uncustomary Easter Sunday. So we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 2 today because in this chapter it's talking about the impact of Jesus' death and resurrection for believers. I thought it was appropriate and so we're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. That's going to be our main text this morning. Uh, we are going to read that text now as we consider what God wants to show us in his word today. Hebrews chapter 2 is a wonderful text. Uh, in chapter 1, the author of the book of Hebrews is teaching us about the supremacy of Jesus Christ, how he's uh, far exalted above angels and above men and He's in chapter 3 going to be talking about how Jesus is greater than Moses. He's the great high priest. He's the great prophet. He's the great king. So all these are themes in the book of Hebrews. And concerning uh, Jesus' supremacy here in chapter 2, we are reminded not just of some theological truths about Jesus' supremacy as the God-man, as the resurrected Savior, but also what that supremacy is meant to do for us in particular, how that impacts our own hearts as we bear witness to the fact that he is risen, he is reigning today, and how does that affect the way that you and I approach our lives? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 is going to be our main text. We're going to begin reading in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, and we'll continue down through the end of the chapter. If you're able, I would ask you to now stand for the reading of God's Word. Now, again, here in Hebrews chapter 2, it's speaking about Jesus. So when it says Him, we're talking about Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not the angels that he helps, but he helps 
the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is God's word for God's people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Please pray with me. This prayer of John Chrysostom guides us in our prayer. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may more perfectly love you and more worthily magnify your holy name. These prayers we ask in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. In the gospel accounts, just going to flash back just very briefly, in the gospel account, uh, in particular the gospel of Matthew, we note how even the creation bears witness to what happened on the cross and what happened three days later. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, Matthew writes as follows. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. That's Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. At Jesus' resurrection, there was an earthquake. Matthew chapter 28. Verses 1 and 2. Now, after the Sabbath, that would be Sunday, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. So we find these two great earthquakes, one at Jesus' death, and one at Jesus' resurrection, marking this earth-shaking truth of what happened when Jesus died and when Jesus rose again on the third day. These two moments are meant not just to remind us that the earth paid homage to her maker, in a sense, but also that we should be shaken as well, that our trust in Jesus' resurrection should be more firm than our trust even on the ground that we stand. And so we look to Jesus' resurrection here as this earth-shaking truth that redefines reality. Now, of course, it is a truth. This is something Christians believe, as Paul reminded us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if the resurrection is not true, then we just need to call it in, go home, and sit down and do whatever we want to do. But if, in fact, it is true, then it changes everything, and we believe that it does change everything. The ground-shaking significance of Jesus' death on the cross is for all of humanity. This significance a significance always has a sign. The significance points to the sign. Well, what is the sign to which these events are pointing? The sign is that the power of God has been displayed. The power of God has been displayed. Now, what is the power of God that has been displayed in particular? Well, let me give you a, a cultural example. Harry Potter in both the first book and the last book of the Harry Potter series. This quote appears, the greatest power in the world is self-sacrificing love. 
The greatest power in the world is self-sacrificing love. And that is what Christ demonstrated on the cross, that God, the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would come and give himself to the full for sinful man. He gave everything he had. He laid it all down in order to give us everything, and that is life in himself. But if his death had been the end, there would have been no significance. It would just be another guy dying a horrible death. But thankfully, his death was not the end. As the creed states, on the third day, he rose again from the dead. The Apostles' Creed treats it as a fact because it is a fact. As much as any fact can be known, this resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is a fact. And there are many reasons that we could give for this. The first reasons are in the Gospels themselves. That is, disciples saw him in the flesh at many times over the space of 40 days. 1 Corinthians 15 confirms this, where Paul adds to the appearances to the apostles, those 12 in the upper room, uh, and many more as well. He also says, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, that... Jesus appeared to more than 500 more of the brothers and the sisters. And if you ask Paul at that particular time, he could give you names. He may be able to give you addresses as well. He would say, well, if you don't believe me, go talk to them because they saw him. And then Paul himself saw him as well on the Damascus road. So there were these eyewitnesses, lots and lots of eyewitnesses, hundreds of them. And they bore witness in their lives, and they bore witness with their deaths. And these many eyewitnesses were willing to die for the resurrected Jesus of Nazareth. As many authors have pointed out, people may die for a lie, but they will not die for something they know to be a lie. That's human nature. People ever since have been living and dying for this resurrected Jesus Christ. But we should not miss the fact that this changes lives. And this is what is truly earth shattering about Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' resurrection changes us. It's not just an earth shattering truth and an earth changing truth. It's also a heart changing truth. And it's meant to change us. So now we're already on the second point of your handout. This is the heart-changing truth and what we're going to spend most of our time on this morning here based in Hebrews chapter 2. This heart-changing truth is something we experience. It's not something we just acknowledge with our brains, with our mind. It's not simply a fact, something we give assent to. It's something we believe. It's something we rest on. It's something we trust in. This is a heart-changing truth. Now, there are a couple of things that appear to us from this particular chapter which are brought to light in the text from Hebrews that we read. The first thing that is brought to light here is that suffering is redefined. Jesus' resurrection changes our heart by redefining suffering. Redefining suffering. Jesus, it is here said, was made perfect through suffering. We see that here in particular verse 10. It was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, that's Christ, the God-man, in bringing many sons to glory, that God should make the founder of their salvation, the founder of our salvation, God the Father made God the Son perfect through suffering. He has been made perfect through suffering. And that itself redefines our suffering. It redefines it because we realize that suffering is a means toward a goal. It's not an end. It's not something that simply happens. It's something that serves the divine and eternal purposes of God the Father. It redefines our suffering so that we can, it doesn't mean that we necessarily embrace it, but we acknowledge that it has a purpose in God's ultimate plan. 
and how much we need to hear that today. The suffering that is happening right now all over the world, different ways, to different degrees and extents, there is a lot of suffering going on right now. Suffering from the disease, suffering from joblessness, suffering from abuse, suffering from hardship and hunger and all manner of other sorts of suffering, these two serve a purpose in God's great plan for the universe. Jesus was made perfect through suffering. That's the original recipe, and we are following that original recipe that we too will be, by God's grace, we who are believers are going to be made perfect through suffering suffering. Now, for those who are not believers, this the suffering in this life is simply a it is something that only pale in a pale way, in a very limited way will be reflected in eternity. Their suffering will get worse for all eternity. And that causes us heavy hearts. That causes us great sorrow as we see people rejecting Jesus Christ. Their suffering will not end up in their perfection. It will end up in their eternal misery. And that ought to break our hearts. It is a sad, sad truth. And I pray that you are not in that situation today that you are indeed trusting in Jesus Christ to deliver you from that eternal suffering. And when you trust in that, it redefines the suffering in this life so that you can acknowledge it as serving God's eternal purposes. So suffering is redefined for the believers. It's not only Jesus who is made perfect through suffering, but Jesus' brothers and sisters, you and I will be made perfect through suffering. Our suffering is no longer viewed as abnormal or as a glitch, but it is normal in a fallen world. And our suffering is a tool in God's hand to perfect or to complete us. It is part of the process of becoming perfect, which will be completed at the resurrection of believers. And so, suffering... In this acknowledgement as being part of God's ultimate plan, suffering is not to be rejected, one, as a sign that God doesn't love me. Suffering isn't a sign that God doesn't love you. Now, if you're suffering because of your own sin, that's a different situation. But just the existence of suffering does not mean that God doesn't love you. It may, in fact, be, in a sense, a sort of reminder that he does love you and that he's using these situations to draw you closer to himself and to disabuse you of other earthly props and trusts and idols. Suffering is also not to be rejected as a sign that I'm somehow a failure. Suffering happens to us all. The rain falls on the just and the unjust Godly farmers can have empty fields. Ungodly farmers could have bumper crops. It doesn't work so simply right now. Suffering is not to be rejected as a sign that we're somehow a failure. Suffering is finally not to be rejected as a sign that I'm just getting what I deserve. Some of us think like that. Quite often, well, I got what I co- what's coming to me. I guess karma is coming back. You know, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. On this side of eternity, none of us are getting what we deserve. Not one of us. No, no. Suffering is a tool in the Savior's hands. But this doesn't mean that we sit passively by or just lay down and give up. In a couple of days, I'm going to be doing a graveside service for a dear friend. She is a model, I think, of this perseverance, this acknowledgement that 
God was working his purposes through her suffering. She had a lot of suffering. She buried a son when she was very young. She buried a daughter. A few decades later, she buried her husband. She buried her grandson. She's had a lot of suffering. Not only those putting her dear family members, committing them to the grave, but also her own suffering through a stroke, a very serious stroke about eight years ago. These sufferings were tools in her Savior's hand, and these were means by which he would draw her back to himself and and give her greater confidence in his purposes, and she stuck with it. I would go visit her at her home, and she would be applying herself. She would be reading a book. She would be reading her devotional. She would be uh, praying for the church. She would be asking about people, uh, perhaps spending time on the phone. She devoted herself to pouring her life out for others, doing as much as she could without getting too worn out, without sacrificing herself. She was a model of suffering well, acknowledging that the Savior's purposes were going to be worked out in her life, and she wanted to encourage others to stick with it as well. You and I have all sorts of suffering in this life. We have suffering of our own, whether it's physical suffering, mental suffering, psychological, uh, it's, it could be spiritual suffering. There are all kinds of suffering personal. There's corporate suffering where we uh, are burdened by one another, we're burdened for one another. All kinds of suffering that we experience in this life, and all these are hard things. These are hard things for us, and we have suffering. But yet this suffering is redefined by Jesus' resurrection. We note that at the end of the Gospels, that Jesus' resurrection body had scars. When Thomas showed up and said, I'm not going to believe unless I put my hand into the scars, and Jesus showed him the scars. Whether our resurrection bodies are going to have scars or not, I don't know. But what I do know is that all these things will be seen to have worked for God's glory and for our perfection. Jesus redefines our suffering. And in this redefinition of our suffering, we have great hope. This changes our hearts. A second thing that we see in this text, which Jesus' resurrection accomplishes, is not only that suffering is redefined, but that the fear of death and the power of death are removed. It removes the fear of death and the power of death. Now, these two are very closely intertwined. Verse 14 speaks first of it, saying that Jesus likewise partook of the same things that through death, through his own death, that is, He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, the power of death. He destroyed the one who has the power of death. Now, Satan is called here the one who has the power of death. Now, this is only true in the sense that Satan can harm people and cause people to want to harm themselves and incite people to sin, just as he did to Adam and Eve. Satan cannot make us do anything, but he can incentivize the sin that leads to death. That's the sense in which Satan has the power of death. And Jesus broke that so that sin no longer has the same allure that it once did for us. Sin has been seen for what it is. It is a, is a counterfeit. It's a lie. And Jesus shows us that he is better. Jesus also delivers those who are slaves to the fear of death and how important this is in our particular time. This fear of death mentioned in verse 15, he would deliver all those who through fear of death 
were subject to lifelong slavery. This fear of death is a powerful, powerful thing, but because of Jesus, it becomes redefined. And that fear of death is now removed. Jennifer and I were watching a movie last night called A Hidden Life. Such a powerful movie. But in this movie, we see that courage that Christ can give, that courage based on Christian convictions to be able to say, yes, death is an enemy. Death is not a friend. It is not something to be welcomed. But death is also not the end. Death is simply the means by which we pass through to get closer to Jesus. And so in this film, the hero, Franz Jägerstetter, he is the one who is able to go to his death knowing that he has done what is right and good. He's been true to his Lord and he's been true to his conscience. And so for him, death lost its sting. It lost its finality because of Jesus' resurrection. Of course, death is painful. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants to go through it. It's not so much death itself, but the process of dying. Nobody wants that. But because of Jesus' resurrection, we see life. We see true life on the far side of death. We see the light of the world. We see Jesus. We see that the valley of the shadow of death is not a hole, but it's a tunnel that leads to life. A number of years ago, Jennifer and I were uh, blessed to be able to go out west. This was our first anniversary trip, and we were able to go to Zion National Park out in southwest Utah. And you're driving uh, out through the desert areas through there, and when you're getting ready to come into Zion, you see the welcome signs, and then you enter this tunnel. And this tunnel just goes on and on and on and on and on around this mountain, and then finally you start to see uh, this light at the end of the tunnel and the light at the end of the tunnel and then you get to it and then you come out and it just bursts into this valley that is just alive. It's just glorious. This is glorious picture. And that is such a beautiful reminder to me of what Christ has done for us. Yes, death is a tunnel and sometimes life can feel like a tunnel, like Who's going to turn on the lights after all? When is this going to be over? But we recognize that Jesus has made death a passage into that which is truly life, eternal life with him forever. Now, there are lots of other illustrations. You see these lilies down here on the altar, and I was wondering, well, why do we use lilies at Easter time? Why, why, do we, why did these become the, uh, the Easter flower, so to speak. Well, there are a lot of reasons, and you may have uh, heard some of these on your own. Uh, one reason is, I think, pertinent here. There are some other reasons as well. It, the flower looks like a trumpet, like announcing the trumpet call of God uh, when Jesus will come back in glory and power and honor, um, that sort of thing. But I think the one that's pertinent here is that they come from a bulb. An Easter lily comes from a bulb, and if you saw this bulb, say, four or five months ago, it looked like a dead thing. It wouldn't be very attractive at all. It's just a little, uh, little bulb. But from that bulb comes life. Something that was dead has come back to life, and this is what Jesus does for us, that our death is not the end of the story, but death is a passage into that which is truly life. Now, finally... Uh, third main point on your handout, Jesus serves as our high priest. This resurrection reminds us. It not only removes the fear of death, it not only uh, shows us uh, the redefined suffering, and it also uh, shows us the factuality, but finally here it reminds us that we have this great high priest who is so compassionate towards us. He loves us so very much. He is a merciful and faithful high priest. He's been through the same kinds of things that you and I have. He's suffered. He's had hard things in his life. He's seen the abandonment of his friends, the rejection of his countrymen, the religious leadership, those who are supposed to love God, 
hated him. He's seen so many hard things. And he's merciful and compassionate toward us as we are seeing hard things too. He's merciful and faithful, and he's able to help those who are being tempted. We have this great and wonderful high priest who is so compassionate towards us. And so we're reminded of our faithful high priest. Our suffering is redefined, and the resurrection is the truth. Let me close with this quote. Uh, This is from a book by Thomas Goodwin. Uh, which reminds us of the heart of Christ toward us even now. Uh, The title of the book is The Heart of Christ in Heaven Toward Sinners on Earth. Thomas Goodwin wrote as follows about the way in which Jesus is compassionate and merciful towards us. Goodwin wrote, His heart, that is the heart of Jesus, Having been just so affected, so wounded, so pierced and distressed in all such trials as ours used to be, only without sin, God on purpose left all his affections to the full tenderness and quickness of sense of evil. Now let me translate that a little bit. God in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's affections, his emotions were completely a part of what he was experiencing. They were fully tender. They, he fully felt all the sorrows of this life. He goes on. So that Christ took to heart all that befell him as deeply as might be. He slighted no cross, either from God or men, but had and felt the utmost load of it. Yea, his heart was made more tender in all sorts of affections than any of ours, even as it was in love and pity. And this made him a man of sorrows, and that more than any other man was or shall be. It is this man Christ Jesus, the God-man, who reigns in heaven today as our faithful and merciful high priest. And so today, this Easter Sunday, we go forth. And so may we and let us go forth rejoicing in our Savior who gives our suffering significance, he redefines it, and he makes our death an entrance to life. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. for who you are, the risen Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling over all things for the sake of your people, for the sake of your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, for being our merciful and faithful high priest. You are able to help those who look to you for grace, for peace, and for mercy. Thank you, Lord, that in this time, this tumultuous time, this strange time, we can look to you as our rock, the one who is made perfect through suffering, and know that no matter what ways we might suffer, we have a God who has redeemed suffering and who gives it meaning. And through it, we shall gain that perfection for which we have been redeemed and to which your people have been destined. We thank you and we praise you. We love you. We glorify and magnify your name today. Christ the Lord indeed is risen today. Hallelujah. Glory and honor. Amen and amen. to see the dawn of the darkest day Christ on the road to Calvary try
tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame. to see the pain written on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood-stained brow this the power of the cross Christ became sin for us took the blame bore the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross now the daylight the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head curtain torn in two dead are raised to life finish the victory cry this the power of the cross cry became sin for us, took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see my name written in the Life is mine to live, won through your selfless love. Is the power of the cross, Son of God, is slain for us. What a If your trust is in Jesus Christ today, the one who has risen from the dead and who changes our lives, changes our hearts from the inside out, I offer you this blessing now from his word in his name. The Lord be with your spirit, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.